Well, good, uh, good morning. It's almost noon. Are y'all feeling good this morning? Cool. Pastor Ben has an awesome word of revelation, and uh, it's always just so good to hear from him. And uh, can't wait for the times we'll be flying him over here, like Apostle Steve has mentioned. Amen. It's coming out of, uh, a, yeah, man, there's, there's a well over there, <laughs> a well of intimacy and revelation. Amen. What I want you to do is turn to your, uh, turn your Bibles to the 84th chapter of the book of Psalms. I uh, had a totally different message until about an hour ago and uh, felt impressed to go a very different direction by the Lord. And uh, this psalm, since I gave my life to the Lord, has been a, uh, I don't really know how to describe. It's just been key in my walk with God. If any of the psalms or even entire portions of the scripture have uh, influenced my life, it's been Psalm 84 as a whole. There's just something about it that is incredible to me. And the sons of Korah wrote this psalm. They had an incredible, incredible revelation. Um, let's go ahead and start with verse 1. I'm going to be reading through the entire thing and breaking down different parts for you. This is going to be sort of in a way following up what Pastor Ben was just preaching on. Um, but more or less from the perspective of the sons of Korah or somebody who has answered that call that Jesus said, come away with me. This is from the perspective of somebody who has answered that call and has lived a life in the intimacy of the Lord, walked in the intimacy of the Lord, and had amazing breakthroughs in that place. Starting with verse 1, it says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts, my soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now let's stop there. When is the last time your heart and your flesh actually cried out for the living God? I don't know about you guys, but my... My heart and my flesh cry out for a burger, you know, cry out for a good movie. My heart and my flesh, they're not usually crying out for a holy God. I've got inward parts that are. My spirit desires him. My soul desires him, but my heart and my flesh. Think about that for a moment. Think about getting to that place where you so realize, after having been intimate with the Lord, as Pastor Ben was preaching about, you so realize that there is nothing on this planet that can satisfy you the way that the living God does. It's like Jesus said. The, the disciples had just brought him food after he got doc, done talking to the uh, uh, Samaritan woman. And he says, oh, never mind. I'm full. Like, oh, well, I guess somebody must have brought you some food, right, Jesus? No. No, I haven't eaten a bite. My flesh was physically hungry. But my flesh got physically filled by doing the work of the Lord. Because of my communion with God, I stayed behind at the well, sensitive to the desire of his heart to meet with this woman. And that place is where I got filled. Imagine walking in that. Imagine walking in such intimacy with the Lord and such obedience to the Spirit. All he has to do is whisper, hey, have a seat right there and just wait a moment. I got somebody I want you to talk to. Just having that whisper and obeying that voice, satisfying you more than even food, I mean, food is one of those things, really think about it. We're always looking forward to, man, we're going out to Rosa's tonight, or whatever the case may be. My wife is cooking something good tonight. You know, 
We eat so many times a day, yet it's always such an exciting moment when we get to feed our faces. Amen? It's always so fun and so exciting to be able to feed ourselves. I mean, we do it so often, but it never loses that. But even that to the sons of Korah was nothing in comparison to the fellowship of the Lord. Their heart and their flesh cried out for the living God. And just to capitalize on that real quick, they said the living God, that's what separates him from every other God. Amen. <laughs> Buddha's still in the grave, I promise you that. Actually, he saw a, an article of a Buddhist who saw Buddha in hell and then got raised from the dead to tell all the Buddhists about it. I don't know if y'all heard about that. There was a Buddhist that died, and uh, the Zen uh, religion, what they do is on the third day after somebody dies, they cremate them. And then every one of the members of their family will come by with a pair of, it's almost like chopsticks. They send them on, on a, like a table through a fire, incinerating them. And the smoke, I mean, it's an intense fire, so it burns them up real quick. And then their ashes and their bones will come out. That's all that's left. And then one by one, they have a family member that goes and picks up a bone and brings it to a jar. And, they, and they, they keep them in the jar. I can't remember what all that's for. But, like, literally, if they were to drop it, like, their family would, would like, shun them for the rest of their life. It's such a, like, a, a very important thing to them. They're so religious, you know. And uh, anyway, that's off subject. But this guy died. He, he was a very well-recognized Buddhist uh, monk and teacher. And right as they're putting him on the table, his body, and they're, they're pushing the table into the furnace. He shoots up awake. And he starts yelling. The Christians are right. The Christians are right. I saw all of our ancestors. I saw all of my ancestors. I even saw Buddha burning in eternal flame. The Christians are right. That article... Of that, there's a video of it, and there's, there's several articles. It's illegal to possess that in the Eastern world. It's illegal. Uh, you will be persecuted by law for talking about it or owning any one of those articles. <laughs> He's the living God, amen? Buddha's <laughs> in hell. Uh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, no, this was about 10, 15 years ago. Okay, verse 3. <laughs> Moving on. Even the sparrow has found a home in the swallow, a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Now, this is an amazing picture, and I asked the Lord for a long time about understanding this. I mean, you know, it's cute little sayings or whatever, you know, very poetic, but what, is, what does it actually mean? It might be simple to you. I don't know. It's very profound to me, but think about this. I don't know if you guys, you know, really put some thought into it, but birds don't exactly build a nest where there's a lot of human activity, you know, or animal activity, period. Uh, you know, uh, Griselda and Isaac and uh, me and my wife, Ashley, are actually uh, renting out Pastor Ben's home, you know, because he's moving and He's got a big home, and he's been very gracious to us, and just, he's helping us all out, and, and we're, we're so, I mean, just, he's such a giver, guys. He really, really is, and I uh, probably doesn't like me talking about him this much, but uh, hallelujah. But anyway, yeah, my, uh, how lovely is Pastor Ben's tabernacle? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, so, so we're staying there, right? Well, they, oh man, I don't know about you guys, but swallows are some of my favorite birds on the planet. I just think they're so cool. They're so agile in the air. I mean, they can turn on a dime. Uh, they catch bugs as they're hopping off the grass. They just, whoo. I, uh, I love them, and they look awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, there was a swallow that came and actually built a nest in a, uh, I don't know what you call it, almost like a balcony um, over the back porch Cover is a cover patio. So in the in the top corner of the ceiling, you know, a pretty good hiding place you would think, because there's not a whole lot of activity out there. We don't really go out there. They built this this nest. Well, <laughs> we go out there, and I mean this bird is this big, you know. 
And uh, you don't want to mess with mama. As soon as you come out there, oh, buddy, I mean, it's crazy. They have, like, others waiting. I don't know what it is. They have some sort of, like, like military force in the background. And all she does is when you step out there, she would fly out, beep, beep, beep. And then all of a sudden, all these other ones come swarming around, and you're like, whoa, okay, I'm just looking, I'm just looking, you know. And I just tell her, I'm not here to hurt your babies, mama. I, I think they're cool. I want them to live. But a swallow and a sparrow, these are very timid creatures. They're very small. They're very easily made prey, except for the fact that they can fly. And they have to build a nest somewhere that is very protected, that is peaceful for their young. They have to live and, and sleep somewhere where they're not going to be harmed. And it says here that they find a resting place. Sorry. <laughs> Whatever, Pastor Aaron. I'm, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the sparrows, they build a nest in the tabernacles of God. They literally feel that the safest place that they can dwell, the safest place, the most peaceful place that they can raise their young is in the very presence of the almighty God. Think about that. Think about this enormous power that says, let there be light. And boom, we got a sun, Right? Man, that can breathe life into a human being. And that's where the sparrow wants to go. Because that power, he's so meek, he's so gentle, that they, they can come and be protected in his presence. I even imagine that the sons of Korah might have even seen nests being built in the temple of God. I mean, think about what that would have spoken to them. Going on to verse 4, then it says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. There's another translation that says Selah right there. That means pause and think calmly on this. They'd have a musical instrumental. They will still be praising you. Is more uh, accurately translated. They will be praising you in stillness. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, who dwell in your presence, just like the sparrow, just like the swallow in her young. In your stillness, in your peace, they will be praising you. That's where, you know, so often we think, I mean, I'm guilty of this. We, we've had a situation recently where, okay, let me just tell you first, it's all taken care of, okay? We're, we're good now, but... We got a ton of tickets very recently because our car inspection was out, okay? Again, it's all taken care of. We're okay. We're okay. I'm, this is not, I'm not taking an offering. Uh, <laughs> oh, I feel a witness. The Lord says. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, either way, this is an old car, right? I mean, it's an old car. I inherited it when I married Ashley, and we are so thankful for it, but we call it the Faith Mobile. I haven't actually told her this part, but we were so blessed by a couple of, of awesome men. I just love them so much. But uh, all day yesterday, or day before yesterday, Thursday and yesterday morning, I was getting up early and heading out to Denton. And these guys were hooking us up with parts and all kinds of stuff, everything we needed to fix this car. And uh, yes, hallelujah, he provides, man. And uh, <laughs> we took out the spark plugs. Um, what's, what's the little piece called that uh, the point doesn't exist on any of them. It's literally not there. Not only that, we've had a ga uh, the gasket for the, uh, it, it, the gasket's been broken uh, for the, pi for the uh, pistons. And so it's been leaking oil for a long time, and it's just gunk. No pins, just gunk. They're looking at it. They're literally like, it's not possible. It just, it's not possible. I mean, we've had like half more than this in, in you know, whatever. And, and we, our, our cars would fail out. It's that we literally call it the faith mobile. And now we have testimony, okay? If your car's ever going out, just speak life. 
<laughs> she would rebuke me, man. I'd be like, man, this car is dying. Go, 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 go. It's our faith mobile. <laughs> anyway, back to uh, the scripture. In, in the stillness, they will be praising you. I'll tell you what, I was not still the past couple of weeks. We owed more money than the car was worth, for crying out loud, okay? And I was just, it's been weighing on me. I mean, you know how those things go. Again, it's taken care of, but either way, I was not in stillness. But there would be moments where I'd withdraw, usually at night when I should be sleeping, because that's some of the only time you get. And man, it would just be those moments. You know what? I don't even need to ask you, Lord. I don't even need to worry about it right now. I just want to be with you because I trust that you'll take care of me. I trust that you care for me. It's like Peter said, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Oh, my gosh. Or the ESV, cast your anxieties upon him. That's what I was doing. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Now, verse 5, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Oh, buddy. Honestly, I could probably preach all day on this verse, but I won't. Uh, We've got a lot ahead of us. Amen? Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Hmm. I like how it says man, not people, because men typically... It's all about what we can do, you know. I feel good because I went and I was fixing this car, you know. Now my strength has helped this car to work. Really, it wasn't much of mine. I was just doing what I was told to do because I don't honestly know that much about cars. So, but you know what? You see what I'm saying? Like, so often we boast in the things we can do. Even if it's not to other people, we get self-confidence and self-worth in the things we can accomplish. You know, you know, whenever we have a successful business or a successful ministry or whatever the case may be, maybe just even your daily life, things that come along and you think, man, I, I, I put some pride in my work. Amen. I was always told to do that. Put some pride in my work. No, I want my pride. I want my strength to be in the Lord. Because apart from him, I'm just a bunch of weakness, but it's in my weakness That his strength shines through me, amen? And whose heart is set on pilgrimage. This is is so big. It doesn't say whose mind is set on pilgrimage. We got a lot of church pilgrims today. You know, like uh, Apostle Steve says, hop from church to church, conference to conference. Oh, I'm a conference pilgrim. I'm setting forth to new lands. New revelation. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about in this place where you are now, your heart is set on pilgrimage. It is set, convinced, I will not be settled here. I will not be satisfied here. I will, my heart is convinced that I will not establish myself here in this world. Any part of this world is going to fall away. Why do I want to build my house on some sand when the the water is coming? My heart is set in heavenly places. Amen? We are sojourners, right? That's what Paul said. We don't belong here. And we have to maintain that sense. If we're going to maintain intimacy with God, if we're going to stay in his stillness, in his presence, our heart has to be set there. You know, and just touching on it, where your money is, there your heart is also. You know, I don't want to get all into that, but it's so true. The more your money is set on things you can invest in here, that's where your heart is. It ain't set on pilgrimage. It's settling itself. It's establishing a colony, and that colony is going to burn. It's all going to fade away. So we want to we maintain intimacy with the Lord by establishing 
that we are not going to settle for anything here. We just want the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. I just know, man, that that is one of the greatest things I look forward to. It's just that day I can go. It said there will be no temple. For the Lord God and the Lamb will be its temple. It's talking about the new Jerusalem. Oh, gosh. Guys, I just can't wait. Can't wait to set my eyes on him. This is what I've been living for. This is what I've stripped away all the worldliness and all my fleshly desires for. That's why I've laid so much down. It's for this right here. This is the Lamb. The Lord God. Hallelujah. Verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. Now, the valley of Baca literally translates to the valley of weeping. You remember that song uh, Matt Gilman did yesterday, the first song they did? I set my heart on a pilgrimage. Through the valley of weeping I will go. Right? Referencing this verse. I love that song so much. But the valley of weeping. The actual Valley of Baca is a, is, is, a, is a geographically small place, but it's a desert, I believe, in, in uh, southern Israel, that nothing grows in. There's no life, not even animals, because it's just so barren. And what it's saying here is as these people, whose hearts are not set in the worldly things, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage to the tabernacle, who, whose heart and flesh cry out for the living God, these people, when they pass through the wilderness, through the dry places, they make it a spring. And the rains follow behind them and cover it with pools. Hallelujah. I was talking yesterday about, or Thursday about the wilderness. It's a whole other part of it. When you live with a mindset of being consecrated for the Lord, loving God above everything in the world, this is what happens. I believe Apostle Steve, yeah, Apostle Steve was touching on it last night out of Isaiah. It says the same thing. You're going to make a stream in the wilderness. You start ministering from, from this point, this point of intimacy with God, total consecration of your heart. It's like he said, circumcise your heart. When your heart is so circumcised for the Lord, that that's the only thing your, your heart is longing for. You can minister to any dry and weary land. And rivers of living water start coming up and feeding that place where no life was before. Hallelujah. You ever feel like you've been in that place and then it's like somebody just comes up and just drops one word on you and you just feel the floodgates open up? You feel like revelation hits you. That's why I've been going through this. That's, that's why I've been feeling like I'm so... Uh, alone and I'm so lost and separated from God in this season and it just opens up to you. You see it clearly. That's what this is talking about. And not just from people, but your workplace, when you're speaking at churches, whatever the case may be. Wherever you go, if your heart is set like the sons of Korah on pilgrimage, if you answer that call, come, come away with me and we will run. This is what's going to happen. Amen? Turn in a place with no life into a place of abundant life. Amen? Verse 7. They go from strength to strength, and each one appears before God in Zion. That, those words for strength actually speak more of victory. That's what it's talking about. It's, it's, you go from victory to victory. Why? Because you face some battles. You face some wilderness. You face some valleys of Baca. But you're coming out victorious, right? Because your heart is set on pilgrimage. You have destined your own mind to be set only on the things of God. My heart is solely placed in the tabernacle of God. I'm not settling for anything less. And that's what keeps us victorious. That's what keeps us from getting weighed down by the, by the weariness of life. I mean, life can just drag you down sometimes, amen? 
I mean, even ministry, sometimes you're just going, 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 and you just start feeling, man, I'm tired. I'm weary. But this is what keeps you pressing on. And you find those levels of victory. And it says, until each one appears before God in Zion. That's speaking prophetic of the new Jerusalem, of the mountain of the Lord when he establishes his kingdom. You, as you set your heart on things above, you set your mind on things above, and you consecrate your heart for the Lord to intimacy with the Lord. This is what it's saying. Victory after victory, you're going to accomplish until you go before that throne of God. Just imagine that for us. In context with this verse, God's looking at all those things you overcame and your desire and your pursuit for him. Just imagine going and kneeling before the throne of God that day. Lord, I've had a long journey. I've come a long way. I've faced some battles. I've fallen seven times, but I've gotten up from them all, right? But I've come for this purpose to appear before the living God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. I feel like the Lord is resetting some priorities right now. Hmm. Even in my own heart, I just feel it. Priorities are being reset. My heart is being recalibrated. Amen? Who feels that right now? Hallelujah. Let's pray in tongues for a moment. Yes, Lord, we yield to you. Lord, we respond to that conviction, God. We respond to that conviction, Lord. We surrender whatever might be distracting our hearts, God. We don't want anything to take your place, God. We want you to be the sole focus and the sole desire of our hearts, God. Hallelujah. Hmm. You see, what is this going to take? What is it going to take? Well, the Bible says we love him because... Yeah, he first loved us. Now, that's a fact that he first loved us. But how much of that are we seeing? When we decide to put our eyes in other places, we decide to invest our heart and our mind share into other things. It's no wonder we're having certain struggles. Because we're, we're, it's not that God loves us less. We're just turning a blind eye to it. Thanks for your love, Lord, but uh, I'm a little focused right now on something else. I don't know about you guys, but, and I love my dad, but that's how I felt a lot of times growing up. Daddy, you know, I want to be with you. Come look at this thing that I built with my Legos, you know? And what does it feel like when he turns around and, oh, that's nice, you know? Maybe he's working in the car, or, hey, drinking a beer, you know, watching television. Well, I felt some pain because of that. How do you think God feels? When we turn in, oh, that's great, Lord. You did a good job. You did a good work, Lord. Thanks for your freedom. I'm going to go and spend my time doing very carnal things. Might not even be sinful. But right now, it's more important to me. How do we respond to that? What will we see in verse 8? O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Oh my goodness, this verse is so good. In the original, you know, they, they, they wrote in Aramaic and Hebrew very different ways. And the emotion that is implied to this verse is a violent cry. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear. That's saying, I demand that you listen to me right now. And what does he call him? Oh, God of Jacob. Why? Because that's what happened to Jacob. I ain't letting you go until you give me your blessing. 
You see, I love how recently I was talking to someone, and this is how they put it. Jacob had always been in the presence of another person, whether it was his family, his, his, his mom and dad, his brother, then his, his, his uh, future wife's father, Laban, and then his wife. This is when he was expecting the worst to come, when his brother was about to come and meet him. And he, and he believed that there was about to be a big battle, and he sent his family separated in two different ways. And this was the first time he got alone. First time he found stillness. And what happened? He had an encounter with the Lord. And he wrestled with the Lord. And demanded, God, hear my cry. My heart has not been fixed upon you. But you've given me promises. Change who I am. From the inside out. Label me something new. Give me a blessing that will cause me to focus only on you. And that's when he got his name changed to Israel. God's own people were born out of that encounter. People consecrated to God. This is how our promise of Jesus Christ came. Because Jacob got a hold of God and said, change my heart. Change me. I'm tired of focusing some on you and so much on all these other things that yes, they give me a benefit here but they do nothing for me eternally. You are my one desire. You are the one I long to serve. I long to be satisfied in you. I long for my heart and my flesh to cry out for the living God and nothing else. That's what the sons of Korah were saying right here. Lord, hear our prayer. Listen to me. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Verse 9, O God, behold our shield. And look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. What is he saying there? What's a sun do? Sun provides warmth, you know, provides light. It's a guide. And it also gives life. There's nothing on the planet that can live without the light of the sun, right? He's saying, God, right now, give us life. Give us true life. Give us true focus. And then he says, and shield. That shield that he's specifically referring to, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it is an offensive shield. It's a shield that would push forward through the enemy's barriers. It's an offensive shield. And we get the full context of it in the next portion. He says, the Lord will give grace and glory. Again, we have to break down the ancient text there. What he says is the Lord will give present grace, just like the present son. He gives us present access to him, present favor to him, and glory. It's speaking of a future inheritance. The Lord will give grace right now and future glory, a future inheritance. He's the son providing life, providing warmth, providing light right now. But he's also our shield. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those that fear him and delivers them. He's delivering us into the promise, into the inheritance. Amen? When we set our focus on God, we realize that nothing else matters except what we have right now. And right now, we have grace. We have access to God. We have access to that tabernacle. Come on, we have access to intimacy right now with the Lord. Amen. We can go right now, but we're also moving forward. He's giving us a shield. He is our shield. He's pressing forward with us, working with us. Like Pastor Ben said, we will run. We are running right now with him to the inheritance, which is what? More of him. Amen. That's the whole concept of it all. And then it says, no good thing will he withhold. From those 
to walk upright. Ooh. A lot of times we would like God to give us something good, but we don't want to walk upright. But the good news is as we're trying, as we're living a life, setting our heart on pilgrimage, the Bible says we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We become the epitome of uprightness. He's not going to withhold anything good from us. And then verse 12, this is the last verse. Listen to how the sons of Korah sum all of this up. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. And I like, I like that uh, exclamation mark there. Blessed is the man who trusts in you. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Why are they summing it up that way? None of this is accessible without trusting God. We aren't going to go to the tabernacle. We aren't going to go to that intimate place with God unless we truly believe that the blood of Jesus did pay the price, that it was really powerful enough to cleanse us and wash us and even stand in the gap for us in our daily struggle. You see, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. It's another word for it, but essentially that's trust. Why? Why is it that God refuses to be pleased unless we trust him, unless we have faith in him? Well, that was the first thing lost in the garden. When God designed man, it was for communion with him. It was for fellowship, for intimacy, nothing else. He gave him all these blessings, but the purpose of it was that he could have somebody to dwell with, to love. But when the enemy started speaking lies, Eve started believing that God was not trustworthy. She second-guessed him. Not only did she not trust his goodness, she didn't trust his judgment. He said you will die. She didn't trust his word. That's what God's been after this entire time. He said the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. How are you going to do that if you don't trust him? It's impossible. Trust is a prerequisite for love. And the sons of Korah understood that. And they said, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Because if he trusts in you, there's nothing in, on the planet that's going to stop him from reaching that place of intimacy with you. That place where he finds even his soul, his heart, and his flesh are satisfied. There's nothing on the planet that can fulfill us. Only God. Only God can be our genuine satisfaction. Amen? Let's stand. Just engage your heart to the Lord right now. We're wrapping up. Lord, you said, blessed is the man who trusts in you. God, we don't want to trust in our own strength. We want our strength to be in you, Lord. We don't want to trust the things that our heart and our flesh might cry out for right now. We want to trust in you, God. We want you to be our satisfaction. Come on, speak in tongues, guys. Keep engaging your heart. We love you, Lord, but we must love you more. God, we ask that you reveal yourself to us, God, so that we can see the truth, so that we can see just how much you really do love us, God. So that what was lost in the garden would be restored. Not tomorrow, God. Not in the new kingdom. But right now, God, because you promised it, Lord. You give us grace right now, Lord, to access your throne room, God. Not figuratively. Not figuratively. We are literally seated right now. In heavenly places with Christ Jesus. What is Christ looking at right now, Lord? He's beholding you. He's beholding your glory, God. Let us behold your glory, God. 
Set our priorities, God. Set the priority of our heart, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Just reach your hands up and touch him right now. Just say, Lord, I want to see you more. I want to touch you, Lord. Lord, I want to touch you, Lord. 